cognitive empathy in a machine, well, the first thing you need to do is define it. And just like we had some good definitions here, but oftentimes there's a, there are a lot of misunderstandings as to what is empathy. Empathy is not, for example, being nice. People think of it as being nice. Empathy is not about being weak. 77% uh, of CEOs believe that if they are uh, empathic, they'll be see too empathic. They'll be perceived as being weak. So there's a, this is not, in fact, I would characterize it entirely the opposite. Being empathic um, can be a sign of great strength. I, I consider it something of a superpower. However, um, there are many people that have wrong impressions. In any event, so when we get to cognitive empathy, we have to encode it. We have to define it well into, in order to be able to encode it. And then there must be things like being able to evaluate it and measure it. And for those of us who are working in the empathy field, we're still far away from having a standard of how to measure empathy. It's it's very peculiar thing. So at the very beginning, I said there are two things I wanted to tell you, two distinctions, cognitive and affective. And this is where the other piece comes in, which is that when you have empathy, you have the person who is receiving the empathy, and then the person who is giving the empathy or, or being empathic. And, and so sometimes you might think that you are being empathic, but the other person might not be perceiving that empathy. So does that mean there is no empathy? Does it, is, is the empathy contingent on the other person receiving it? And you might say yes. So the, the receiver is the person who can judge and evaluate and measure. Well, let me put, it, put out another example. In my old days at Redken, um, making shampoos. And um, I don't know about you, but in the shower, shampoo, uh, well, it's, sometimes it's a little slippery and that's because it has silicon in it, right? And so it's happened to me that the bottle has slipped out of my hand and then you sort of have, you have the foam in your eyes and you're bending down trying to pick up the bottle. Well, one of the things that we decided to do for one of the, the shampoo bottles, and maybe uh, Paul will remember this, but we decided to put ribs on the side of the bottle the, so that when you hold the bottle, it would have, you have a little bit more traction to it as opposed to some round object, cylindrical object with silicon that would be easy side out. So the idea here is we applied empathy in the design. Of course, if you really want to be a good designer, you have to have empathy. But it's very unlikely that any person who was shampooing with my Redken shampoo was saying, oh, these guys are really empathic. What they were saying, oh, this is really good. They like the bottle. It's really useful. It doesn't slip. But they're not attributing any empathy. So a lot of times in, in the uh, use of empathy, you're not going to have a distinct, a discrete ability to say, oh, I see the empathy. So it's a very tricky thing to be able to, uh, to measure and evaluate. And in all the efforts to um, encode empathy, I believe it'll be an extremely exciting opportunity for human beings to understand more about empathy and maybe consider why we're doing it. So a couple of use cases for empathy and AI, and just to lay it out, and then I'm going to finish with some big questions. First, use cases. There is many more use cases of AI plus humans as opposed to a standard or you know, a standalone empathic AI. So it's AI that has empathic attributions that will work with humans to improve, for example, marketing claims or taglines. It will help uh, customer service agents with maybe writing taking out some of the tasks, adding in some more empathic elements into it. For example, using data sets to learn more about the client that the customer agent doesn't have the time to scroll through and allowing them to feel a little bit more empathic in the answers that they provide to their customers. Uh, in, in general, in messages, you, could, you, can, you have now AIs that can stop and say, hey, Paul, that message you're about to send, stop one second. Let me invite you to add these two other sentences that would make me in this interaction with some other person will make Paul's email a little bit more empathic. And then you have the second use case, which is empathic AI standalone. And there we have 
chatbots that are becoming more and more, they're trying to make it more empathic, at least at the very outset. They're looking at making cars like Tesla and such have a more empathic AI within it. Um, and then, uh, then the last one is therapeutic AI, where there, they are, there are several pro projects, uh, generally over in the West Coast in America, looking at creating therapeutic AI like Hume, uh, .ai or Cyrano.ai, and the other one is Empathic, no E, just starts with an M, Empathic.ai, and all of these are run by psychologists who are very keen to create therapeutic AI because today there's a, a lack of supply, a sufficient supply to deal with the crisis of mental health uh, it, that's available in the world. So just to finish um, with some big questions, as we look at this idea of empathy and AI, especially when you're in business, when you're looking at doing it, what is your actual culture in your business? And, and make sure this consistency, can you, can you identify your culture and make sure it's consistent with the type of AI that you want to encode to represent yourselves as a company? What is your intention when you start looking at using AI and rendering it more empathic? And what is your ethical framework that you are going to use and to what extent that's well communicated throughout the team, including the coders who oftentimes may not speak your same language, maybe not in your same office, and generally are empathically challenged because logic and empathy make for poor bed partners.